you know that from the online part that this course was created in 1995, and that's a date I would want to remember. Uh, but I also want you to understand that 1995 is what 23 years ago now, and this course has not been updated since. So this is is, is old, in some respects, old information. There are 10 modules in this, or 10 lessons. 10 lessons in this. This is module A, the classroom portion. Module B is what we're going to do when we're driving the ambulance. Module C is your on-the-job training that happens when you go to work during the human service. A little story about that. When I first moved to this area, I walked into a couple of different places to become a paramedic to work here. Walked into one and, and be trying to be professional, slacks, shirt, tie, looking good. Walked in, walked up to the director, and he said, oh, are you Todd? And I said, yeah. He said, you got a paramedic license? I said, yes, sir. He said, here's the key to the guy sleeping on the sofa. Go grab him. We got a call holding. And he said, well, there's a call, 911 call. We need to on that. I'm like, um, um, I'm here to interview. He's like, yeah, yeah, that, that call's holy. Can you go get it? I'm like, does that mean I'm like working here? He's like, we'll talk about it later. So that was my orientation. So I ran my first call with this ambulance service, shirt, tie, all dressed up. Um, had no idea like what radio frequency to use. I just moved to the area, so I didn't even know about the gear system and calling the hospitals. I knew what I did when I worked in Atlanta, but here it was totally different. So um, that's not the company you want to go work for, by the way. That was that was bad. Um, so hopefully you'll get a better on the job module C training than what I did did there. Um, so the first nine lessons were online, and this is lesson ten, which I usually save for the the classroom, um, just because there's there's usually some questions and some things that we can discuss. So this this run. There are three parts to this. There's before the run, the pre-run, there's the run, and then there's the cleanup stuff or post-run afterwards. So this pre-run phase, we always want to check our equipment and our ambulances. You are personally responsible for missing equipment and potentially malfunctioning equipment. That means equipment on the ambulance and the ambulance itself. So if you didn't bother to check the batteries in your AED at the beginning of your shift and you run a full rest and you go click, Click, oh, it's dead. You could be held liable for that. You can ask Chicago Fire about that to the tune of about $2 million when they had some ADDs and they didn't ever bother to check. Uh, but you can be held liable for equipment malfunction. Now, some things, you drive it on the road, you blow the serpentine belt, and your ambulance just dies. You are not held liable for that. Unless you were supposed to check it and you didn't. And when they find it, they realize that it was terribly frayed. It should have been replaced, but you never inspected it. Or your ambulance suddenly seizes up because you didn't check the oil, which your policy manual says you're supposed to do at the beginning of the shift. So make sure that when you do your inspection, you actually do what you're supposed to do, and then you also document. This is probably as important as any of the PCR documentation that we do. So if something fails, you want to document that it was, it was working when you inspected it. You also want to document that it was there. And this is what gets me about some of the ambulances that I've worked on. Is there's typically not critical equipment, but well, maybe we're missing the hammer, extrication tool. And how many times has somebody just and it was there, they said it was there, but it really wasn't. Um, or, or a piece of equipment has gone past its expiration date, but they just went ahead and marked it anyways, versus changing it out. That's the stuff that can come back to get you later. So make sure you're, you're doing your inspection. If you do find something wrong, and you can make the repairs, you better do that. Now, when I first started, um, we didn't have a whole lot of like certified ambulance mechanic tech deal. So if we had to like pull the engine and do a rim job on it or something, I think we kind of just did that. Uh, if we didn't know how to do that, we just read it in a manual somewhere. Those are for you two days. But we did a lot of stuff to our ambulances. But as liabilities got worse, um, we do less and less. So right now I think I'm allowed to, I'm allowed to add oil. I could probably change the windshield wipers. I don't even know if I'm supposed to do the headlights anymore. We did the back lights, we'll do the tail lights ourselves. Um, you can do those? They yes. allow you? Yes, we did them today because <laughs> one of them shot. <laughs> so there, there's less and less that they allow us to, to do on these ambulances. And part of me is okay with that because I'm not a mechanic. I don't really know a lot of this stuff. I don't want to be like changing out brakes on my ambulance. If I mess that up and I run into somebody, that's a lot of liability. So I would take it to the certified mechanic. But there's a few little things, and every service will have different things that you can do. And even if you know how to do certain things, and you have done it in your personal vehicle, if you are not authorized to do it on your ambulance, don't do it on your ambulance. But 
the certified mechanics do it because they take the responsibility. And you also need to check your log to see if something, maybe last time you worked, there was some sort of rattle, noise, you know what it was, you took it to the shop, and you come back and you see it sitting out there, don't just hop back in it and take off and assume it's been fixed. Check the log to make sure that the repairs were done that need to be repaired. And once you've done all this stuff, you can kind of put your ambulance to service. But you gotta make sure you inspect it, make sure everything on the vehicle is working like it's supposed to, all your equipment is there, working like it's supposed to, and everything's still in date, and then if there's any repairs, they were done properly. So, you're at your shift, one of the crew members only had an hour of sleep. Now, how many people come to class with only an hour of sleep sometimes? It's like most everybody at some point. <laughs> um, so this is gonna happen at work, too. You'll get there and your partner's like, oh, my kid was sick all night. Uh, I think I slept for 30 minutes. How do you handle that? <laughs> the way I have done this um, is, yes, I'm the one that's driving. And I'll let them work it back if we can do that. So if it's me and another paramedic, I'm like, you get patient care for a while, I'll drop. And the reason I say that is if he falls asleep and does something stupid in the back, that's only one person. Or if he falls asleep driving the ambulance and T-bones someone, that's a lot of people. So the, you kind of limit the risk there. Now what I have done and what people have done for me um, is I'll get there and I'm like, dude, if you only had an hour of sleep last night, go lay down, go take a nap. I'll go check off the truck. No, 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 I'll have to, no, no, go, go take your nap, I got it, it's okay. Someday, we'll reverse that, you check the truck, I'll take a nap, it'll happen, it goes around. So, let them do that. Um, but if that call comes in 15 minutes later, and they're still half asleep, yeah, I'm driving. Why don't you just send them home, tell them to go home and take a nap? Because we want to actually do something. Yeah, because if you go home, you don't get paid. Oh, for your shift. Yeah. So now you could call in sick, but depending on how much sick leave you have, if you even have sick leave, or the policies with your sick leave, you may not get paid. And are you and a few of you and I have just talked about paying bills and making sure we got enough money and all that. And trust me, I'm, there's a few months where I've, I've run out of, of money before I've run out of days. Um, and when I was first starting in EMS, that happened a lot because EMTs don't get paid as much as medics. Um, and now so construction on Main Street, got a lane blocked, got a baseball game that afternoon, and maybe some thunderstorms. Anybody else get caught Monday? When I got up Monday morning, came into work, I looked at my, I was like, oh, there's like a 5% chance of rain today, I won't bother bringing a raincoat or anything. We got, what, three inches in 90 minutes? Mm -hmm. So many of those emergency alerts kept going off on my phone. It's <laughs> a word for all of that. That was probably a good, safe, dry place to be. I was trying to drive another job. So, um, when we see this, what does construction tell us? Slow traffic. Yeah, that's going to be a mess going through that, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So we need to, if that's our primary route, we want to try and find an alternate route around it and see if there's a better way for us to go. Um, same thing with the baseball game. So I know that probably an hour before the game, everything around that area is going to be congested. And then during the game, not a problem. And then as soon as the game ends, it's going to be a total mess in that area again. So I need to watch uh, for traffic during those times. And with the thunderstorms, make sure I got my raincoat. Um, make sure my windshield wipers are working. Because when do you know your windshield wipers aren't working properly? Street. Yeah, but it's when it's raining, right? Mm -hmm. Who wants to get out and change it in the rain? Mm -hmm. They get wet. So you're like, oh, I'll just do it the next time it's sunny or the next time mm -hmm. I work. It starts to again. Yeah. <laughs> no. Uh, so it's one of those things. And, and I'm... I'm almost to the point where I think we should change our windshield wipers on the ambulances like every month. It should be the first of the month, we just go ahead and change them because nobody ever wants to do it and nobody thinks about it if it's not raining on their shift. So, so those are a few ways that things will, things will change for us. Ooh, now this one. Smoke. Are they still in the building? <laughs> so the the answer to the question, what should you do to prepare the ambulance for another run, is you have to clean it up and restock it. Now, how do I handle that? Let me give you the two scenarios. First one, you are swiping your badge, clocking in, and you hear the beep, 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 of the ambulance backing into the bay. And they're like, dude, this was a T-bone. Somebody blew through that stop sign at like 60. It was a mess. We had four patients with blood everywhere. I'm like, oh, dude, I'm so sorry. 
let me help you. Because at that point, one of them is going to have to sit down and do a heck of a lot of paperwork, probably going to be there until 8, 9, 10 o'clock anyways, just doing paperwork. Um, and it's not their fault that the call came in 20 minutes before shift change, and they just have not had time to clean up. So that happens. I'm going to jump in there, be my best help, and clean up and restock. I think all of us are good with that. Flipping around, you get there, you swipe your badge, and you're like, oh man, this was great. We slept all night long. We had a call like 8 o'clock last night. I don't know what happened. I think somebody turned the phones off at 9 one because we went to bed and slept all night long. It was awesome. And then when you go out and you look in the ambulance, and it's a mess from that call that they had at 8 o'clock. Come here. Step out back for a moment. Uh, maybe not quite that, but I'll let the crew get away with that once, but if they do that more than once, the supervisor's like, hey, dude, here's a picture of evidence. This is, you get on them, you better do something right them up. So, um, so I'm all right with it when it happens right at shift change, but if they've had time to clean up, hopefully they have. If not, we still need to, regardless, get the ambulance ready. Remember, you have to inspect it, you have to make sure the equipment's working, the ambulance is working. So how about this one? Yeah, we've got to fix it. You can't really drive it without brake lights. Now, if both brake lights are out, that makes me think there's probably a fuse somewhere that went bad. It's kind of odd that both brake lights can fail at the same time. But I might still try to change both bulbs. I check the fuse. But if I can't get the thing working, that's about as far as I can take it before I have to send it off. Out of service. Yep, it's out of service. Now, if sometimes we can go out of service and there's not a spare ambulance. And I like that. Because then the whole time my ambulance is being worked on, I'm just sitting at the station watching television. I can't take a call, I don't have an ambulance. And I'm getting paid, that's nice. <laughs> More likely though, you have a spare ambulance. <clears throat> so then what do we have to do? Check the ambulance. Yeah, we run out of that backup ambulance. The thing I don't like about this, and why I try not to take my ambulance out of service, is that backup ambulance usually has almost nothing on it. It's the oldest service, or the oldest vehicle on the service. It's a piece of junk. It's loud, it has leaks, it's, the air conditioning barely works, you know, it's just ah, terrible. And you have to swap all the equipment over. So all the 4 by 4s and all the IV catheters and all the other pieces of equipment have to be swapped over to that ambulance. And then when they fix yours, you have to swap it all back. And that's just a lot of work. So I try not to take it out of service if I can avoid it. But you can't run it. I don't have to lights. So. All right, so the operations phase. This is the actual doo-doo-doo, you got the tones, you are, woo we're going. So this is going to be leaving for the scene, going to the call, taking care of the patient on the scene, and then transporting them to wherever we're going to transport them. Now remember, for the most part, this is going to be pick them up, take them to the emergency department. There aren't a lot of times we're going to transport somebody else on emergency call. Not emergency call is a different story. So. While you're responding, or not while you're responding, you're sitting at the station, then you get paged out to a call on a busy street. What do you want to do? Make sure you've got all your stuff in the car. Yeah, make sure you have your equipment. And this is a fun thing that happens in the winter months. We're getting close to winter. Um, even though there's supposed to be heat, in, heat index of like 96 or something tomorrow, I, I'm told that. Um, there will be a cold day someday. Might be February, but we'll have a cold day. Uh, but many of our ambulances are left outside. And at night, when the ambulances aren't running, it's cold. And many of our, our medications, if they get below 50, they're not supposed to, well, we're not supposed to let them get below 50. If we do, they're supposed to be ruined. So on those nights that it's cold, and we don't think we're gonna be letting the ambulance run all night, we might take the drug box and bring it inside, where it can stay warm. Not all ambulances have heater coolers in the back. So some of the older ones may not. Maybe you're in that spare ambulance because your other one was out of service because of the brake lights. So you have to take that drug box in. That's a really bad thing to forget when you're on scene with that asthma patient that's <laughs> and you're like, oh, I'll get my albuterol. Oh, I don't have that. I left that at the station. When we would have put it at the foot of the door. That's what many of us have done. Is so you're, you're going to trip the over it, if anything. <laughs> now, um, there has been a time or two, actually only once that I'll admit to, um, where I thought my partner had the stretcher in the emergency department, and he thought I had put the stretcher in the ambulance in the emergency department, and we got another call, and we hopped in the truck, and we took off. 
And we get to the scene, and we open up the back doors, and we're like, oh, no. I really hope this person can sit. And fortunately for that call, it was, uh, they were able to sit. So we had to try to act like that. It was normal we'd have you sit in the back of the ambulance, and there's not a stretcher there. So we got away with it. But there's sometimes it's not. That's, not that's, that's a really bad call when you're like, hey, dispatch, can you send another ambulance? Why? I don't have a stretcher. Well, I don't get fired. <laughs> Sometimes the nurses get fired. So like, Why would you have a stretcher? Why are they like when they're practically gone? Or a wheelchair at least. Yeah. Like, they didn't want a wheelchair. We all knew. Unless you feel So, one thing, make sure you have all your equipment. Um, many ambulances, they're kept inside because there's so much equipment on them nowadays and so many things take um, energy. Like, I'm charging the suction unit back there, I have it plugged in. Well, you don't want to take all this equipment off and plug it on the wall of the station. You can plug it into the ambulance and then plug the whole ambulance in. We call it a shoreline. Mm -hmm. So make sure that that shoreline is disconnected. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, if it's plugged in the side of the ambulance and you take off, that extension cord is usually only 25 feet long. So at 25 feet, something snaps. And um, if it snaps in the middle, you end up with this orange kind of snake trailing to the ambulance. Um, I may only have known about that once. Um, I couldn't find the where we left the rest of the extension cord. Um, nowadays, uh, many of the shorelines actually have a discharge, so when you turn the ambulance on, it blows it out. Now, if at 2 o'clock in the morning, you're not paying attention, and you're half asleep, and you climb in your ambulance, and you flip that, it's a loud bang. You will be awake after that. Uh, at least out of the one ambulance that I worked out, when I've forgotten that, and I clicked it, bam! Ooh, okay, I'm good. <laughs> We're good. Um, so I try to unplug that. Now, the other thing that I've seen ambulances done, and I have never done this one, um, although I have seen other ambulance crews take off and be like, wait, wait, no. Um, many times we open up the doors, um, even the cabinet doors sometimes, to kind of let things air out, disinfect, to get rid of smells. Well, the doors typically, when they open up, are wider than the door to the ambulance bay. So then when you hop in, you forget to shut the doors, and you drive out the ambulance bay, they hit on the sides of the door, of the garage door. And um, if you're lucky, it'll just slam and shut real hard. If you're not lucky, it'll just knock the door off. And that's uh, that's, a, that's not a repair you will fix. You will not like, oh, they can just be attached to the door here, get a little lows, get a couple of hinges or something. You just get out of that service real fast. Yeah. Um, what's, well, that's embarrassing enough, but what's probably more embarrassing is when you pull out of the ambulance station, you've gone around the corner, you get on the first big main street, and you realize well, one of your cabinet doors was left open because when you made the corner on the main street, all your backboards went sliding down the highway. And now you're trying to like, you got the lights going, the siren going, you're trying to gather up all this stuff, and dispatch wants to know your ETA, and you're like, I don't know, I'm just at the corner of the station, get that out of it. Never mind. <laughs> then another ambulance. That would be awful. So. <laughs> so those are some things you, you need to do. Okay. Bloody. Yeah, you got to go through an alternate route. The ambulances can uh, can uh, get stuck in. Turn around. Turn around. <laughs> now, if you haven't gone through all the soft chalk lessons yet, you may not know the official answer for this one. But you're coming up on a controlled intersection with traffic lights. If you went up and it's blue and it's red, you pause, you flip it both ways, if it's clear, you go through it. If somebody starts coming, you accelerate. Yep. Now the official one is you're supposed to be in, in a, a certain whale or a certain side of boat called whale. And you keep that up to about 300 to, feet to 150 feet away. At 150 feet, you switch over to yell. And the idea of switching the tones as we get closer is that that up and down one, people just block that out. Uh, but when you switch, then they are like, oh, what was that? Pay attention. Now some people feel that the more they can switch the siren tone, the better. So there's a little knob, mm -hmm. and I know the driver's supposed to have their hands on the wheel, so they're not even supposed to be messing with it, but most of the time, they do anyways. They reach down there, and they're like, <laughs> and they're flipping the thing back and forth, and there's no pattern to it at all. Um, and then, and while they're doing that with these fingers, they're hitting the air horn with that one. Uh, the old days, when you had to actually pull on an air horn, 
that was an error for The problem is you, you do that too much and then you lose your air pressure and your brakes didn't work. Um, uh, so now we have electronic air horn, but they're just not the, not the same. But anyways, they can hit that many, many times. Really, we're only supposed to do that um, a couple of times. So you take your foot off the accelerator, let yourself come down to a stop or near stop, and at the crosswalk, when you stop, two toots of the air horn, and then you look left, right, middle, make sure everything's clear, look back left again, and then you can proceed through at a um, slow rate. Now this eye contact, so when you pull up, I want to look and I want to see that the driver in that first lane sees me and is stopped. Me and I are like, okay, I'm going. Um, so if you can make eye contact with me, you want to. Hand signals are okay, just make sure you use all your fingers and not just one. <laughs> now once I have cleared the first lane, I can proceed through, but I'm only going to go about 5 to 10 miles an hour. In every lane, I'm going to clear. So if it's a two lanes one way, two lanes the other, I'm going to do this four times. I want to clear each lane. And then I can go through. And then once I'm through it, I can uh, uh, I can get back up to speed. Now there's a few things um, to be cautious of when you're going through intersections. One, that they don't hear you. Uh, cars nowadays are incredibly sound resistant, soundproof, compared to what they used to be. So they may not even hear you. Um, and I'll admit that even with my old van, I'm in 2005, there have been times where um, somebody's come up and I, I just didn't hear them until they were pretty close behind me. And I don't listen to the radio loud, I, I just, it's, it's set pretty low. Um, I was coming to work one morning and Florence Fire was running, I was coming down on Pine Street and they were coming off of, I think, Tuscaloosa or something, but there's a couple of big buildings there. And so I didn't see them because of the buildings, and I sure didn't hear their siren. And we were right on top of each other. And I had the green light, and they did. Fire trucks don't always stop at red lights. Um, so that was a really, really close call. And uh, I had to call and say, call back later and say, hey, yeah, you were driving. That was that silver minivan you needed to hit. That was me. Hi, I'm so sorry. But I never heard them because the um, buildings blocked the siren. So you have to watch for, for people that just don't, don't hear it. And then there's also people that just don't pay attention to it. Or don't want to pay attention to it. Um, if you have other emergency vehicles, um, a lot of times people are looking for the one or they hear the siren, so I think it's the one. So if you're the second one that's coming through, they're not looking for you. So they see the police car go through and they're like, oh, I wonder where they're going as they drive out into the intersection and you were just a moment behind them. Now sometimes the police will pull into an intersection, turn on the lights and block the intersection for us. Um, which is great. I mean, it's really nice of them to do. The problem is not everybody at the intersection knows why that squad car stopped in the middle. So sometimes they're like, well, I don't know why you stopped. I'm just going to go through. And they really aren't looking for you then. So be very careful when you have another emergency vehicle in the intersection. And we don't pass on the right. We do our best not to pass on the right at intersections. We always want to pull on around to the left. And then there's all the other just pedestrians, bicyclists, stuff in the road, hazards that we run into. The reason we don't pass on the right is that. Because what are cars supposed to do when they hear an emergency vehicle or see an emergency vehicle? Mm -hmm. Pull to the right. So if you go to pass on the right, they're going to pull right in front of you. So make sure that you always pass on the left. So we have this little situation where this one is pulling out in front of you. And there's three things we try to reduce if we think we're going to have an impact. Speed. Try to slow down as much as you can. The amount of vehicle that each is impacted in the collision. Like if you can clip the corner, you want to clip the corner as opposed to the full contact. EVOP calls that reducing the angle. So reduce the speed, reduce the angle of the impact. So instead of a T, try to clip it so it's not going to be as direct of a force. And then if you can, you get to pick between two objects. Do you pick the harder or the softer one? Go for the softer of the two. So um, this is in the, in the presentations, but I used to have a picture of like a hedge and a brick wall. And all my students always wanted to hit the brick wall. I'm like, you're stupid, please don't drive for me. <laughs> if you have a choice between a brick wall and a hedge, hit the hedge. I'm like, there to be children on the other side of it. I'm like, don't drive for me, please. Um, if I see you as my partner, you will not be driving. Um, so I changed that, and now I have a cornfield and I have an oak tree, and you have to pick which one would you rather hit. 
Um, and if you're worried about children in the corn, or of the corn, then we got other issues. <laughs> So, you arrive on scene, get another emergency vehicles and personnel there. How do we handle that or what do we do? Just uh, dispatch. And what? Forward the RC. Yep. So, we notify dispatch that we're on scene, and then when we hop out of the truck, we look for the firefighter with the white helmet. That's the chief. That's the incident commander, typically. Or they're wearing the vest that says incident commander. I see. Okay. I see. Um, EVOP calls him IC incident commander. Uh, I know we change those terms from time to time, but. EVOP wants you to remember it's incident commander. So that's typically the highest ranking firefighter on scene, whatever that officer is. Um, and this is something that the fire departments have, have developed and the rest of us have kind of taken it in this whole incident command system. It's a really, really good system. Um, EMS rarely practices it, but fire departments do it on nearly every call. They pull up on some little fender bender and they are establishing Highway 72 Command, where we gain four refusals. Um, but they, they just do that, so that's something that they do every time. We don't do that in EMS very much, so we're not used to doing that. And we oftentimes will butt heads with fire departments over this because we don't really understand what our job is. The guy with the white helmet is the one that's in charge of the scene. Do what they said. So arrive on scene, and typically there's like, hey, I'm, I'm Todd Owen, paramedic Keller, where do you need us? And they'll say, hey, we got these guys, that guy, this guy, go take care of this one. So they're the ones that'll tell us what to do. Now when it actually gets down to the do I split this first? Do I put them on oxygen first? That's not the incident commander, that'll be you. But as far as which patient to go to, who's leaving the scene first and all that, that's the incident commander. And what if you're first? Scene side of the first well, Yeah, we have to do all that. But if you're the first one, you are not, you got the cave, you are the incident commander. Everybody else, do what I tell you. <laughs> Until the first firefighter shows up and then you have yeah, so you get it for like 15 seconds and then here comes a fire truck. But we do want to do scene side. We do make up something like this. But then we'll do four. So, uh, this actually was just blowing the cold from the blue channel. Uh, the power lines are falling on the same track. So they're standing in their house going, oh, I don't think I'll go outside. Well, they were, they were more smart about it, but I could see some of the young walking out to see what this is, what happened to the land, they puddled at the time that you did. They went out with that. So, when we have a hazard, one of the things we have to do is go make the roof of the But then, oh, God, Yeah, that was pretty cool. I'm glad they were home. So that's the day we are now. Not that, oh my goodness, the power lines are down on my fence. There's a problem. I should probably call 911. It's like, oh, let me use my phone so I can video. So. Now, crowds. Um, we're talking about passion for it. So I'm in New York visiting my sister, and we're going to see a, a play on, on Broadway. Um, so that, I mean, that's pretty darn cool. And we're walking down whatever little street this was, and it's a crowded mess. We were not going to see Hamilton, but Hamilton was just letting out. And you know how big Hamilton was that year, and it was like 50,000 people waiting to go see it. Um, so this street was packed, and here comes a fire engine. And what's the first thing I think of? Hey, I need to get a video of that, because that'll be used in EVA. You're talking about thinking about things in the shower. <laughs> I'm always thinking about how can I, how can I use this. So there's a fire truck in there trying to get through this crowd. And this made me really think, well, I didn't believe it they deal with this all the time. Um, so we want to obviously drive slowly through a crowd so we don't run over anybody. Um, and, and there's two really types of crowds, because this crowd was not upset, was not angry, everybody was just there waiting to go for the show. So this group was pretty easy to work with. But then there's also more like a riot type crowd, and I might handle that a little bit differently. But we're gonna go with nice crowds right now. Um, you may get the police there to help control the crowd a little bit and, and provide you a route. Um, and then the one I don't like that EVOC recommends, have, have your partner hop out and stand in front of the ambulance and say, hey, everybody clear, we gotta get through? Everybody get through? Um, so I don't think I really wanna stick my partner out in the middle of the crowd like that. 
Now, I can see something like that. You're at the Spirit of Freedom celebration, 4th of July at the Farland Park, and you're like, ooh, my patient is over there, and there's this crowd. One of you is like, hey, we gotta get through, can we? But generally, the crowd will pay attention. Either use the PA, or flip your lights on, and just a couple little quick doo -doo type deal, and they'll all turn and look, and you start moving, and they'll get out of your way, generally. But don't just woo, 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 and go on two miles an hour trying to get through the crowd. That's just gonna annoy everyone. Now, when we pull up on scene, what are some things that we need to consider for parking? Open access to get out. Yeah, access to get out of the ambulance, and access to load the patient, and access to leave the scene. So there's really different accesses there. Access seats. Access. Access. Accesses. It's not axis as A X I guess. So I don't know what the plural of A C A C C E S S. Yeah. Axis is yeah. anyways. You gotta make sure you can get out of the ambulance. Make sure that if you need to leave, you can leave in a hurry. And make sure you can get your patient in and out. And equipment. So that's all stuff. Now when you're looking at like the scene of a wreck, um, if you're the first unit on the scene, you want to park where you block as much of that lane as possible. So no other cars coming along that road will run into you. So a lot of times we'll have car wreck, ambulance, traffic flow. So they don't run you over. So we, we do need to think safety first. We always back in in houses. Why do we back in in houses? The, I could have loaded in the back, and that's not going to be closest to the front door, so it's easier for me to access the back of my ambulance to load the patient. And if something goes squirrely, it's much easier to hop in the front of the ambulance and drive away going forward than it is to try to back down somebody's driveway when somebody's going to like, take a shot at you. So we always back in if we can't. Are we allowed to drive in people's yards? Do it all the time. Mm -hmm. Just remember when you're driving across somebody's front yard, the septic tank may be there. Mm. That's, that's a really bad day when you're driving along, boom, and your ambulance is in the septic tank. What if they like, like, what if it's one of those lawns that's like awarded the most beautiful lawn? I try not to, but you know, if I have to, if that's the only place I can go, that's where I'm going. Would you come back and fix it? Um, I might. If I had time, I would try to do something. If not, they're probably going to get a call of a supervisor and somebody's going to have to go fix it. But it's not high on my list of, of important things at the moment. Rarely do we have real issues with where to park. Not to pick on the volunteer firefighters, but that's been some of our biggest issues, is when there's an interesting sounding call, people that don't normally respond show up. And those that aren't used to responding and show up tend to plug up the roads and driveways and park right in the middle of everything. Most of those that do that on a pretty regular basis realize, hey, we need to leave the place with the ambulance, and they'll park further away and walk. I personally like this one. Because you will feel like this at some point. You're going to have to carry the stretcher, the backboard, the jump kit, the oxygen cylinder, everything else. Your paramedic partner is just going to stroll on in. Now, you've seen this. You know this. What do you do before we move the ambulance? has to be done. Every TV show, movie, there's an ambulance involved. It has to be done. So they do it on every single one. You know it has to be true. When I close the doors, yeah. why? I have no idea. <laughs> but everybody does that on TV. I don't know why they always slap it. Um, well, because I'm not going to listen for someone slapping the back of my ambulance to take off. I'm not a horse. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm going to listen to my partner who says, hey, Kate, we're good, we got everything done, we can go now. And then I put it in park and take off. I know why we did it in the military, because normally the guy who just loaded and shut the door and hit the back isn't driving. He's not going with the truck. So you hit the truck, the back of the truck, so the guy who is driving the truck knows you're good, go away. Okay. That's why That's why we did it, because we're not going in the truck. Yeah. Otherwise, you just walk around and get the patch seats and everything. Now, now, I do want to make sure things like you have all your equipment. So if you brought a bag in, try to bring that bag back out with you to get in the ambulance. Glucometers get left all the time on scenes. And, and most of the time families are okay if you go back and you knock on the door and say, did we leave something here? Do you mind if we check? But I really don't like to do that. I don't have to. 
radios is another one. So I'll have a radio, they'll put it down, and then they'll get busy, and off they go in the ambulance, and they're like, oh, hey, there's a radio. Um, so those get left. So make sure you have my equipment. And like when we were first leaving the ambulance bay, make sure all the doors are closed. Because we opened them up to get equipment out, so make sure that they are all closed before you take off. I right, drive along, got a big bump. What do you do? Try to slow down, try to go around it if you can avoid it. Or are you one of those that's going to try to go fast enough so you don't fall in it, you just scoot across the top of it? <laughs> that's I, not say, very good I, I, I don't think I'd recommend that one. I don't think that's going to be the answer on EBA. You see a big hole in the road, drive fast. Do it for no. Now realize your partner in the back does not see that there's a big bump in the road. So they might be standing up, they might be going to get something, they could be leaning over the patient to try to get something on the other side, when you hit that bump there, are suddenly face planting in them, and that can be a rather embarrassing moment. Um, or it can be harmful, you can get hurt. Um, especially if the patient is standing up, or not the patient, the partner is standing up, hopefully the patient's not standing up. You got other issues if your patient has stood up in the back of your ambulance. Um, so a lot of times if we have somebody like pull out in front of us, we have to stop in a hurry, or we have a big bump, we shout something to the back, like hard stop, quick stop, bump, and that way hopefully the person in the back knows to sit their butt down and be a little bit safer. Of course, it's a good reason or a good, yeah, that's a good reason to just be seat belted when you're in the back at all times, unless you just absolutely have to get out. So the way I run my calls, my partner and I, when we load the patient, we both get in the back of the ambulance, we get the oxygen hooked up, we get them put on the monitor, we get another set of vital signs, I get them my IV if I need to, any other treatment, and then I think about, is there anything else I need to do? Nope, we're good, okay. I sit myself down in the back, I talk with my patient, I'm seat belted in, my partner goes up front drops. So what if you're gonna do CPR? Can you strap yourself in while they're no, there? No, that's why doing CPR in the back of the ambulance, a moving ambulance is stupid. Now if my patient codes while we're going to the hospital, I will do that. But if I'm in somebody's living room and we are coding them, I'm not going to move in a van to drive down the road because I can do poor CPR and it's a lot of danger for all of us. That's what I was talking about. If they code it into that, yeah, there's not a way to strap yourself down. Nope. That's the one thing that's really good about an automatic CPR device like Lucas is it can do that and I can still be sequenced. <coughs> now, after the run, when you have a mess, there's two things that have to happen. Somebody has to do paperwork, somebody has to clean up the ambulance. So as a paramedic, I usually have to do all the paperwork, get my nurse's signatures, the doctor's signatures, and then I have to sit down at the computer and type all this stuff in. And then my EMT has to clean up whatever mess I'm in and restock things. So restock all the equipment that was used, decontaminate things, clean it up, and, and get it ready for the next call. So that's kind of how we divide things up in EMS. One person does paperwork, one person cleans. And it cleans the stretcher, new sheets, and all that. Um, now, I try to be a good partner, and I do my best job. My sharps, my needles, will always be in the sharp container. I'm not going to leave those. But I'm going to do my best if I will tear something open to try to hit the trash can. But there are some times where there's just too much happening in the back of the ambulance, and I don't really care about making sure I gather up all my trash, don't put it in the trash can, all my patients over here squirting blood. So I, I have to do what I have to do, and I have left my ambulance like this once in a great while. Um, and it's just one of those things that happens. Um, now, most of the time, you wipe down your stretcher, put a new sheet on, load it up, and you're good. And you get back to the station, you go to bed, and your paramedic partner is typing in. We picked up Mr. So-and-so for the 12th time this shift. 